Hello. <laughs> so, I am here to discuss the science of dogs. So, that was voted on by the viewers who wanted to see, um, to essentially what I do is I put up a poll and then people let me know which particular topic they want to discuss. And so this week it was a tie between dogs and influence. So I'm going to talk about the science of dogs this week. And then next week I'm going to talk about the science of influence. So here are the science of dogs. And here's a picture of me. See, it's a self-portrait. Looks just like me, doesn't it? Not really, so, but oh well. So, the science of dogs. So, let's learn about dogs. Well, there are about 350 breeds worldwide, and about 157 breeds are just in the U.S. alone. So, 350 breeds recognized worldwide. Um, 157 just in the U.S. They have all the traits. We have curly tails, long snout, short snout, short, nine inches tall, tall, three feet high, um, wire hair, long hair, floppy ears. We have all these different traits in dogs, you know, so we can see this and we can breed them. There are all kinds of variations in them. And with that, we also have variations in behaviors. All right, so we've got herding, guarding, hunting, retrieving, alarms, woo, ding, ding, and to where they're barking at everything. And we have with and without instruction. So they're able to do these things even though they're not instructed to do so. All right, so a question we pose here is, how long have we had dogs? How long have we been taking care of dogs, like breeding them how we want? How long is this been? Well, in the fossil record, we have evidence to show humans and dogs have been interacting together for about 400,000 years. Now, wolves. I should say wolves. Now, we're responsible for dogs, but we do have evidence in the fossil record that shows we have a connection with wolves that dates back as long ago as 400,000 years ago. Now, we start to see our domestication of dogs that we have now is around 15 to 40,000 years ago. And this is where we see this domestication happen. Um, now, there is mitochondrial DNA that kind of suggests that perhaps approximately greater than 100,000 years ago, there have been other domestication events that we've been able to see um, in you know, the genetic code. Now, that suggests that, but there's no definitive proof of that just yet. So, next question we have is, wolves, dogs, all the dogs. What happened, man? Is that even possible? You know, so we've got this. We're like, well, you know, how is this even possible? Like, well, we have something called artificial selection. And I'll get into how this is pretty interesting with the evolution of dogs. But we have a thing called artificial selection. People mated the dogs with the traits that they wanted to have show up. So we have the hunting, the herding, the alarm, um, floppy ears, curly tails, all of these sorts of things are related to traits that we wanted to see manifest in these dogs, all right? So about 13,000 to 17,000 years ago, that's a long time ago, Russia and Germany, that's where we first see changes in wolves from the standard wolf-like phenotypic expression, fancy word for traits of that are expressed through your genetic code. So, first changes in wolves about 13,000 to 17,000 years ago in Russia and Germany. That's where we kind of start seeing that. Then about seven to 10,000 years ago, dogs, dogs everywhere, you know, in even in the U.S. So we start to see them up here in all over the world and the different types of breeds start to pop up. And then they're like, but wolves, though, wolves, though, they had all these traits in them. You sure about that? Wolves, you know, <sighs> that's pretty interesting. Some people think, wolves, did they have those tiny dog traits in them? You know, how's that possible? Well, there's some evidence in actually genetic evidence. Dog genes, not denim. The difference between dogs and people, especially when it comes to, for instance, let's take height. In humans, you might have 11 or 12 different genes that determine how tall you are. 
dogs don't have that. They only have one or two, so there's fewer genes that control a particular expression of a trait. And since you have fewer genes to do that, they can change rapidly. So you also have what's called um, conserved types of DNA. And so in humans, there's perfect copies of particular genes that show up. Now, dogs don't have that perfection. They have slight changes within those genes, which can lead to variations to where we can see these traits happen rapidly. People are like, behaviors, all right? So because your behaviors can actually be dictated by your genes through something called neurotransmitters, um, changes in genes can change your brain chemistry. So your neurotransmitters and being able to receive them are gonna be a bit different. So we can see these different behaviors happen. And then you get questions like, for real, what's wrong with my dog? So dog behaviors. So you gotta keep in mind, people are responsible for um, breeding dogs for them to do particular things, especially in regards to behavior. Barking, um, herding, hunting, guarding. All of these different things people have encouraged the expression of in dogs through mating them with other dogs that have these strong characteristics. So but see, people are like, but for real, what's wrong with my dog? <laughs> what's wrong with my dog? Well. Dogs can actually suffer different types of um, mental ailments, but it's not necessarily the same as people, but you know, we don't have a lot of information in regards to that, but we do know dogs can suffer from anxiety, depression, narcolepsy. Yes, narcolepsy is the thing. Dogs can go to sleep randomly and OCD. So what's interesting about this is that we can see this manifest in dogs. It also helps us to be able to study the genetic patterns and hereditary patterns of anxiety, depression, OCD, and narcolepsy. So we can use dogs as a genetic model to kind of give us a general idea of how they might express in people. So now we're gonna talk about something else called ethics, harmful breeding. All right, so harmful breeding. Let's look at the pug. So we have these designer dogs now that people are trying to breed to get them to have this really flat, mushy face and people are like, oh, he's got a mushy face, it's so cute. Well, here's the problem. Pugs that have that flat face have a harder time breathing and they're miserable. And it actually shortens their lifespan. So when you look at these particular dogs and you see their little mushy faces like that, you're like, okay, oh, they're so cute. Well, that dog is not breathing so well. You've bred this dog to have this cosmetic effect, but it's not able to breathe as well as like another dog, a pug with a longer snout. So you have to take in mind, there is harmful breeding. The ethics of dogs, you know, just because you can cosmetically cause a pug to have a smushy face, you know, and their genes can change rapidly to where you can have these traits show up quicker as opposed to, um, other species. Cattle hasn't changed that much, but then you look at dogs, we're able to um, genetically alter dogs pretty quickly just through mating them. So you have to take in consideration the ethics of harmful breeding. So you don't, do you really want a dog that's only going to live a few years and pay thousands of dollars for it just because it's got a smushy face um, and that dog is miserable. So that leads to the last little bit. Be kind to dogs. We bred them to love and serve us. So, and I'm scientist Mel, so if you're going to go and get a dog, consider the type of breed that it is because you look at chihuahuas were bred to hunt squirrels in Mexico. You look at dachshunds were bred in Germany to hunt badgers. So we are responsible for all of the diversity we see with the dogs. All right, so unless you're a farmer or you need a particular dog for hunting or something to that effect where those particular traits are good, if you have a lot of kids, get you a cattle dog. Those cattle dogs will keep those kids together <laughs> and be like almost, oh, not really like, you know, a babysitter, but they're quite helpful. <laughs> so if you're looking for a type of dog to do a particular thing, that's where breeding is important and good for you. But if you're just looking at having a cosmetic dog with a smushy face and it's not gonna breathe well, you know, just don't. Um, and if you just really want a pet, just to love you, 
We bred dogs to love us and to serve us. A shelter dog is going to give you, likely give you, the same type of love and care as you'd get from a particular um, puppy mill, is what they call them, or a breeder. So, I am Scientist Mel, and this has been The Science of Dogs. Woof, woof. You can watch the videos here, or if you prefer Twitter, I am on Twitter, and I do the same thing on there. A bit more engaging with that in regards to Periscope, but you can check me out there. Check me out here. Hopefully, I will have a YouTube channel soon, but that has been the science of dogs. I have one person on here, and you got like the tail end of it. I don't know who it is. If you want to say hi, I can take your questions right now. I have a bit of time left. So, um, I'm basically, the sum up, since you're just joining, <laughs> the sum up has been, we've got 350 breeds of dogs, worldwide, 157 in the U.S. All these traits that we can see were there, actually they're there because we helped get them expressed through, um, and behaviors as well, guarding, hunting, retrieving, um, through what we call artificial selection. Let me pull that slide up. Through artificial selection, we made it dogs <laughs> for the sole purpose of having these particular traits expressed. We have been in a relationship with at least wolves for 400,000 years, and we start to domesticate dogs around close to 40,000 years ago. We look at wolves now and they're like, what happened, man? How did we get all of these breeds of dogs from these things that don't look like dogs? Russia and Germany, we start to see the first changes in wolves about 17, 13 to 17,000 years ago. They start to diverse diverge from looking more wolf-like. Seven to 10,000 years ago, they're here in the U.S. and everywhere else in the world. Wolves do not have all of these traits in them. That's something that's different. They have the ability to adapt and evolve and change over time, but these traits didn't exclusively sit in there for this reason. As opposed to people, people have about 11 different genes that control their height, but dogs may not, may only have one or two. That breeds generally have shorter lifespans, larger breeds. Um, yes, that's customarily been seen, especially with the larger dogs. The smaller dogs, they have less wear and tear on their bodies. Larger dogs have more wear and tear on their bodies. You have to also, you can kind of compare it to humans. Larger people tend to have a shorter lifespan because of the effect that, you know, their body has to regenerate a lot of cells in order to um, handle the wear and tear that it undergoes every day. So that can shorten the lifespan. Every time your cells need to replicate to um, regenerate tissue that's been, you know, damaged for various reasons, you're aging yourself. And so dogs, it's the same thing. Dogs can age if they're larger, and you know the larger ones, they're running around, they're going to have more, you know, gravity on them, and so they're going to have um, more bone density, they're going to have bone cells that have sometimes, especially if they break a leg, they're going to have to regenerate muscle tissue. So all of these different factors um, play a role, and the more the cells have to divide um, to repair tissue and to compensate for, you know, just being larger, because <laughs> you're more likely to have damage done to your tissue than the um, faster you age. And we see that in people as well. Um, so, and in dogs, we see these um, traits manifest a lot faster, um, as I was saying before, because of the fact they have fewer genes to control a particular trait. I believe we have like six genes that control our eye color and then we have like 11 that control our height. So dogs can be affected more through breeding than um, we see with people. But that's a very good question. Thank you for that question. Um, and some people ask, they ask, well, you know, behaviors, dog behaviors, you know, how do we see this? Well, if um, dogs are able to have their genes change so quickly, we can change these genes, 
you know, it's going to change the brain chemistry as well. So we have um, neurotransmitters. They may be more susceptible to certain ones and less susceptible to others. So we can breed dogs in order to have these particular traits like that constant, I've got to go get that stick, you know, and retrievers go and they run and they get that stick and then they pull it back. You know, that's an in innate behavior and we've bred them to do this automatically. So we see that in the genetics. Um, and some people worry about what's wrong with my dog? Why does my dog act this way? Well, we bred dogs to love us and to serve us. So when we look at the types of, and this is a sum up of what I was talking about before, dogs can suffer anxiety, depression, narcolepsy, and OCD. I don't have enough information on any other neurological disorders in dogs. Um, in, another in another broadcast, I had somebody mention epilepsy. I kind of want to go study on that a bit more now because I didn't realize that was the thing. Ah, yes. The smaller number of genes in dogs plays a role. It's, um, now there's a, there was a long standing thing a long time in genetics where they thought one gene controlled one thing. That is not the case. Um, one gene can do lots of different things. And you may have one trait in humans that's controlled by a whole lot of genes. And so there's a lot of conservation of genetic code that doesn't change in humans, but it can change in dogs pretty rapidly. And they're able to see that. So wolves did not have the small dog trait. They didn't have, you know, the short haired trait. They didn't have those things. So people kind of forced evolution onto dogs because dogs have those just fewer genes like maybe one or two control a particular trait as opposed to people who have 11 genes that control how tall we are they might be just one or two for dogs so you're able to see those rapid changes within a few generations of dogs and so you can have a particular gene persist in a hundred years and just stay with a particular dog if you continue to breed for that presence of that gene so a tall dog, a big dog. If you want to breed a whole bunch of big dogs, you get you a bunch of big dogs and you just keep breeding with big dogs and that gene is going to stick around. Um, but you can shift pretty quickly with that. And so then I also talked about harmful breeding, ethics of harmful breeding. Um, pugs in particular with their flat snouts, they don't breathe as well. So if you want to do um, a particular breed, you need to be a responsible owner because the pugs, um, especially with the cosmetic and, you know, fashion type of dogs, it's fashionable to have a pug with almost no face. Well, they don't breathe so well. Um, and their lifespans are shortened for that reason. Um, so you have a miserable dog that can barely breathe and you're carrying it around all day <laughs> and you've spent thousands of dollars on this dog that's miserable its entire life. You know, what kind of life is that? So we are responsible for these traits. So if you're looking for a dog that has a particular characteristic because you're a farmer or you're a hunter, or maybe as I mentioned before, you have a lot of kids. If you have a lot of kids and you want a dog that's like a cattle dog that can herd them all together while they're playing in the backyard, you know, sure, check into the breeds for that. But if you're wanting just a dog because it has a cute smushed face, you need to understand that there are ethics behind this in regards to the fact that this could be, your pet could be miserable its entire life because you've gone and decided that you want to get a cosmetically fashionable dog. So that's where I say, if you just want a pet that will love you, and we bred dogs to be very, very loyal to us in our relationship with wolves go back 400,000 years. So we have a responsibility to dogs because we're responsible for all of the breeds and the populations. And we, <laughs> we basically genetically engineered them to love us through artificial selection. They're inherently dependent on us. So since they're that way, you know, any dog that you get at a shelter, unless it's been abused inherently by people and developed a distrust of people, is going to love you just as much as any other dog because it's in their code. Now your dog can suffer anxiety, depression, that sort of thing, and there are treatments for that actually. There are treatments for dog anxiety, which then leads us to, since we can see this manifest in dogs so quickly, 
You know, especially with these genes, we can use them as a genetic model to study hereditary, heredity and hereditary aspects of OCD, anxiety, depression, narcolepsy in people. So we can kind of see the patterns for that in dogs and use them as a model to study this pattern in people and kind of say, yeah, it is hereditary. So we can kind of see this in dogs. So we should be able to, you know, see them in people. This has been a pretty cool talk. Facebook usually is kind of quiet from time to time, but you guys have hopped on. This is pretty cool. So that's essentially the science of dogs. So, you know, yeah, be kind to dogs. We bred them to love and serve us. You know, you grew up with border collies as sheep dogs and noticed they tend to get OCD-like behaviors. They got older, just started hurting just about everything. Yes. Well, I mean, you got to think about it. People have... um have um, genes that make us predisposed to addiction and various other things. And some people, they just can't, it's an uncontrollable need to do these sorts of things. So it wouldn't be too far fetched to kind of um, apply it to, you know, a dog situation and say, if you throw that stick and that golden retriever's like, oh my God, a stick has been thrown. I got to go get it. It's probably going to have the same response to where it feels like it's an overwhelming need to go and get that stick. Like, who's a good boy? I'm a good boy. I'm going to get that ball. You throw that, I'm going to get it. And so, you know, I'm not, I, I can't actually read the minds of dogs. But when we see that type of behavior and positive reinforcement associated with that, as well as knowing how people are and our, need, our feelings of like uncontrollable type of feelings you know to where they're just pressing can you imagine how that's like on an animal <laughs> that doesn't have the same cognition we have and that they're just like oh gosh I like oh and you got like a pack of kids I've seen this happen with um border collies and you know and and other cattle dogs with children um and you'll see a group of kids and if you've got like a, a cattle dog and one of those kids starts to stray that cattle dog, that bothers them. They're like, oh, no, no. And they'll, they won't bite, but they'll nip at the heels of the person, of the little child to get them back in the group. That's just what they do naturally. It bothers them. Like, no, no, no. I got to keep my group together. I got to keep my pack together. They can't be straying because we might have bad wolves out there and coyotes. You know, we got we to gotta keep the group together. <laughs> and so they have that part, that pack sense. So that's what makes it cool. Um, with dogs is they see us as as part of their pack and so they've just kind of adopted that but they are inherently dependent on us because we have bred them to be this way and so that's kind of it's almost like a, a separate type of cruelty um, when it comes to dogs and, and when we, we've domesticated animals for us to do these things for us for us to be cruel to them because it's 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 a much deeper betrayal, you know, because people are responsible for dogs being this way. And if you're not going to be a good dog owner, you know, you're, you're kind of not only betraying that species because we're responsible for that species, you know, it's just, it's like a, it's like a whole separate level of cruelty, in my opinion. Um, it's just, you're betraying that dog because that dog, you know, just wants to love you. So it has that genetic precursor. I just want to, I just want to serve. I just want to love you. And if you abuse that dog, that is like a, a terrible, in my opinion, a terrible betrayal, especially given the history we have with wolves and dogs. So, so be kind to dogs because they will love you forever because they don't know how else to be other than how you teach them. Um, so people like pit bulls or so, you know. No, pit bulls are taught to be awful. <laughs> and they're actually quite lovable and really loyal to their owners. And they will guard their children, babies, their owners. They'll guard them. And, you know, it's just dogs are taught things. <laughs> so they're taught to be cruel. Every once in a while, you get the cruel one. But early on in history, when dogs were being um, evolved, when we were, you know, steadily, artificially breeding them and select, you know, through artificial selection, we kind of like weeded out the ones that attacked the kids or attacked us. They, they just took them and shot them. You know, they're like, yeah, we don't need that. We just need the ones that'll be good to us. And so if you have a dog, because genetically that was slowly tried, they tried to weed that out. If you have a dog that's attacking kids, 
you know, that's an owner problem. That's not really a dog problem so much as it is an owner problem. So, yes, I'm almost, I'm almost out of time. I got a few minutes left. So this has been pretty cool. I'm glad you guys popped on. I'm almost out of time, but you'll have to think. He's Sherman Mark Williams just joined right down there. He drew my dog. This is my picture over here. I managed to fix it to where it's not mirrored anymore, but now it's all backwards on me. So my picture, that's a self-portrait. I don't draw, but Sherman Mark Williams do that. And Monty, my, my comic book friend, do the rest of it. So. so if you guys don't have any other questions or you want to chat for a few minutes, I got a few minutes left before I have to go and do the things. <laughs> Because I have stuff I have to do today. But it's been pretty cool. It's been pretty cool chatting with you guys. Um, hmm. But what I'll do is the paper that I read um, for this particular bit of information that I'll have. I'll post on my Facebook page on Scientist Mill on the Science Hub. And so you can have an opportunity to read it as well. You've been taking care of dogs for a few of your friends. Um, and relatives when they had to leave them for half a year or more. Does that disturb the dogs when they change for packs for long periods of time? Hmm. That would be a pretty interesting thing. <laughs> You're welcome, Darcy. Um, so that would be a pretty interesting thing to kind of study um, in regards to those types of behaviors. And I think it depends heavily on the species of dog. But I would think that if a, if a bunch of dogs were um, considered people... Um, part of their pack if their pack was missing they can exhibit anxiety and depression so they may behave a little bit differently than somebody who is not their owner but um, over time you know over a bit of time you can become part of their pack too I have a friend of mine who has um, oh gosh she's part hound um, and she she lives in London and his name's Hudson and Hudson might see me once a year but he's incorporated me into his pack so every time he sees me he jumps on top of me and licks my face for like five minutes <laughs> so, Hudson is an awesome dog he's super sweet and all he wants to do is sit by me and snuggle because he hasn't seen me in a while but when he sees me he's like oh my gosh you're here you know you've been gone nine million years <laughs> and so um I think I think with my personal experience and what we kind of see with certain breeds, if you um, are incorporated into their pack, they kind of accept you. So the idea is to kind of get into their group. And so if they're missing other members of their pack, if you're there too, that kind of helps as well. So that is pretty interesting. There might be some studies on that. But I will post, um, and the paper that um, I read is a review paper a lot about the history of dogs. It's pretty interesting. And it's it, there's not any heavy terminology in it. So it's, it's actually quite um, an easy read. And it's not a long read. Um, it kind of sums up a bit of, and it gets in a bit more detail than what I got into here in regards to the information that I read. And I already had some prior knowledge being I used to teach science in high school and I talked a lot about dogs then. But I'll post that paper on my Facebook page. Um, I promised somebody I'd look into the epilepsy of dogs, so I want to see if there's any new studies involving that. Um, but this has been fun. Next Saturday, I will be talking about the science of influence because I did a poll, and it was like tied right down the middle between dogs and influence. So next week, I'll talk about the science of influence and how it can be harmful, especially like with manipulation and gaslighting, and we're kind of seeing that with um, a lot of what's going on in politics right now, and so it's kind of important for people to be able to understand um, what these terms are. Uh, how is it possible that somebody that has um, a very awful past come into power? How is that possible and how does that happen? Um, the science of influence. So I will be talking about that same time next Saturday. So every Saturday I'll be on here. Have a chat with you guys. You can ask me questions. I will do my best to answer and I'll have some idea of, you know, I'll have information to be able to talk about this topic. It's very unscripted. <laughs> I essentially just have an outline and then I just talk about the stuff I know and what I've read in regards to studies and scientific studies. And then we have a chat 
and it's kind of cool and you can ask me questions and if I can't answer them I'll at least direct you to where you can find the answers from a good reputable source so I do have a video from last Saturday on the scientific method that is on Facebook as well and so I don't delete these videos so if you happen and you can't hop on and have a chat with me that's okay you can always check it out later and shoot me a question about it and I'll be happy to answer it oh okay Malamute oh, okay I see some collies Malamute and Amstaff put Pitbull unknown mix huh that's kind of fun to see what kind of um, qualities pop up in dogs when you're not 100% sure what their ancestry is. <laughs> well, this has been cool. Thank you again for popping up on here. And I hope you guys have a great Saturday. And I'll be back here the same time if you prefer Twitter. I have a Twitter account there. And I, have, and I go on Periscope right before I hop on Facebook and do this. So... You guys have a fantastic day. This has been a lot of fun. And I guess I'll see you next Saturday. And if and I always have like a daily quiz, usually on my Facebook page. Um, it links to a Twitter poll. So you just click on it and then you can pick what you think the answer is. And then I'll post the answer. I wish Facebook had a poll option. <laughs> but it seems to not accept through live. And I haven't quite worked out how to do that yet. So, but anyway... I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I've enjoyed this. This is fun for me. And you guys have an awesome Saturday. And I will see you next week with the Science of Influence. This has been the Science of Dogs. Woof, woof. <laughs> you guys have a great Saturday. Bye.